Welcome to St. Mark's United Church on June 6, 2021. We are so pleased that you have joined us for worship. And today we honor and respect and pray for and remember the 215 children who were discovered last week in, near Canloops, BC at the Indigenous Residential School there. We join with the world as they too pray today for the families, for the victims, and for all those that were involved in this tragedy. So as we join together in prayer, may we remember that God has come to the world in the light and love of Jesus, and that God walks with us each day guiding us with the Spirit as we try to do our best for God's world and God's children. Let us pray. Creator, we give thanks for this day and each day you grant us life to walk on this great land, our mother. Give us the heart and strength to come together in prayer in time of mourning, reflection, and peace. The news that we have heard these last week of our relations, our families, and the children who were physically taken away from their parents and their homes and who have now been found. And with this news, we grieve their memory for their struggle and for their spirit. We pray for good understanding, guidance and love for all the families and communities who will need direction and resolution at this time. We have come together in prayer to ask for your light to guide us, to be a part of that needed peace, support, and resolve for everyone who is reacting to this great tragedy in our indigenous nations of this great land. Creator, be with us. Allow us to be brave. Allow us to be strong. Allow us to be gentle to one another. Allow us to be humble. But most of all, allow us to be like Christ's love. Peace be with us. We lift up our prayers to you in love, trust, and truth. Peace be with us all. In Jesus' name, amen. We gather as those who worship the one true God, who is without weakness, who is beyond criticism, who is honorable and fair, who is just and merciful, who is not the outcome of human choice or raised to power by partisan nominations. She is God, creator of heaven and earth, present at the beginning and who will be present at the end. He is God, who favors no one over another, who cares for all with a depth and emotion unrivaled. Come, let us worship, not human power, celebrity or wealth, but let us worship the one who deserves all we have to offer.
Let us pray. Strong and steadfast are you, O Lord, ruler over all creation, each human created in your image, bound to you in love, called to serve. From the dust you raise us and place us in communities, each with gifts and graces meant for sharing. Forgive us, Lord, when we can be stubborn, we can be selfish, greedy, and unloving. Forgive us when our fear overwhelms us and drives us into poor decisions. Forgive us when doubts seep into us and cause us to question your way. Lord, help us to face our fear and doubts, to bring them to you and seek your guidance. Give us courage to follow in your way and give us strength to make the right choices. Help us to lead each other in your way today and always. Amen. The scripture lesson for today are selected verses taken from 1 Samuel chapter 8. Samuel was the priest and the prophet who would reluctantly anoint Saul as the first king of Israel. The people have not been satisfied with the prophets and the priests, the religious elders and judges that they had. They wanted a king to be like other nations with kings. This text speaks of the problematic rise of the monarchy in ancient Israel, and it opens with a warning about the evils of kingship. This story goes under the heading, be careful what you wish for. All the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, north of Jerusalem, and said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us then a king to govern us like other nations. But this displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you. Instead, they have rejected me as king over them. Just as they have done to me from the day I brought them up out of Egypt to this day, they have forsaken me and served other gods. So also they are doing this to you. Now then listen to their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel reported all these words of God to the people who were asking him for a king. Samuel said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. After forced military conscription and the making of more weapons, and the theft of the people's best vineyards and olive or orchards, Samuel continues, the king will take your male and female slaves, will take the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to work for his benefit. He will take one tenth of all your flocks and you shall become his slaves. And in that day, you will cry out to God because of your king the king whom you have chosen for yourselves. But God will not answer you in that day. The people, however, refused to listen to the voice of Samuel, and they said, no, we are determined to have a king over us so that we also may be like the other nations, so that we have a king to govern us and to go out before us and fight our battles. And that's the end of the reading for today. Amen.
Good morning and welcome to our time for the young and young at heart. Today I want to talk a little bit about how sometimes we think we really want something and then we turn out being really disappointed. Now, I can remember a time in my life on the back of comic books, and maybe it's still there, I haven't bought a comic book in a very long time, was this advertisement. You know, some of your parents may remember this, or maybe you've seen it yourself. For $1.25, you can see right here, $1.25 you can buy a wonderful world of amazing live sea monkeys. Well, when I was a kid, I asked my parents, I think probably weekly, if I could send away and get my very own um, sea monkeys. After all, it was only $1.25. Well, they said no for a very long time until one day I had my own $1.25 and I decided I was going to invest in my own little friends, the sea monkeys. So it came one day in the mail. It was all very exciting. I, I got them. And um, there was this bag of stuff that looked kind of like dust. And you, we, I needed to have some um, purified water. And I was to put the purified water in a bowl, sprinkle the dust, and within minutes, I would have a family of sea monkeys. Well, was I disappointed. I was very disappointed because those sea monkeys um, looked something like, oops, something like this, um, except they were not this big. This is quite large. I would have been afraid if my sea monkeys had gotten this large. The sea monkeys that grew in my glass bowl were about, oh, maybe that's too big, about that big. And they looked nothing like these handsome and beautiful um, sea monkeys that I had been promised. It, it was very disappointing and I learned a lesson that, you know, sometimes I think I, I need something or want something and maybe I need to think about it um, hard because back when I was a kid, $1.25 was a lot to save. And um, so I had to learn how to spend my money a little more wisely. In today's story in, from scripture in the book of Samuel, we hear about a prophet who shared God's message with God's people. And he had done this for a very long time and he had been quite successful at um, keeping the communities, the 12, there was 12 tribes of Israel and he did a really good job at, you know, talking between the groups and keeping them all um, happy and in right relationship with each other. We need someone like that right now for our indigenous communities and us. Um, but then one day the people came to him and said, you know, we really, really want a king to run our country. We do not want a judge anymore. Now, when I say judge, um, I don't mean like Judge Judy. I mean um, a judge who kind of ran the whole country, including um, military activities. So he would lead his, his country people into war and help protect their citizens. So Samuel was a little hurt because he'd been running the country, the country and um, but he had been chosen by God to do so. So he thought, I'm going to go talk to God about this. In conversation with God, God says, you know, Samuel, don't take it personally. It's me they're upset with. And so um, God says, but tell them what will happen if they get a king that they, they very much want. And so Samuel went back and told them that, you know, it's not going to be perfect if you get a king. A king, you know, is going to spend a lot of money on building a, a, a court, a castle, or, you know, a, a building for themselves and the people they want to live with them. 
They're going to spend a lot of money on protecting the country that, you know, 24-7 instead of only when we need it. They're going to probably need money to pay for the things that they, they want in their court. And so they're going to ask you for that money. And Samuel went through all of these things, but the people still wanted a, a, a king to run their country. So this week, I wonder if you could think about what it is that sometimes you think that you really want. And then think about the things that people have told you that maybe you don't really want that, that it's not going to be perfect. And also maybe think about what about a ruler, a king or a queen or a prime minister or somebody who runs a country, what is it about that person that you think would make them a good um, ruler over the country? And would having a king or a queen be the best thing for our country? Let's say a prayer before we go to um, the time with your paper bag ministries. Let us pray. Dear God, we do not always know what is best for us. Help us to trust that you love us very much and that you know what we need to safely live and be well. Amen. Have a good week. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So the way my week usually unfolds means that on Friday morning, I enter what I call my sermon vacuum. I sit down and I start to write my sermon. Sometimes it happens earlier, but generally it's on Friday. I sit down to write my sermon and um, make some edits, and then I start to record the pieces for the service. And I really don't wrap that up until Saturday in the evening when the email goes out to you folks to let you know the link for the service. Well, often that means that I'm not spending a lot of time Friday or Saturday watching the news or checking my Facebook feed and seeing what my friends are posting about what's going on in the world. So what that meant this week was on Sunday afternoon as I came out of my, my vacuum and began to speak to the folks who had come to coffee hour after church, I heard of the very sad, very disturbing um, discovery of 250 children near Kamloops, BC, in, um, in, a, in a mass grave. Much like it was for many of you, that hit me hard in the gut and in my heart. I cannot believe that things like this have taken place in a country that I love, that a country I'm proud of, that these things have taken place and people have known about it and kept it silent for many, many years. That these families whose children went missing never until now and I can't, I can't think that they have peace even now for the, the, the lives of their children. It was truly, truly upsetting for, I think, most people. Now, so what that meant, however, was that Monday morning when I woke up and entered into the week, I, I felt kind of hopeless and helpless. I felt that there wasn't a lot I can do to help the situation. There's nothing much that I could do to possibly make justice occur in, in what has unfolded in residential schools across our country um, for far too long. And I can't imagine what systems I would even have to approach 
to address these covered up crimes against children um, in Canada and, and all around the world where indigenous communities have been um, disrespected and dishonored. So I headed into my traditional reading of scripture for next week's sermon, for today's sermon, and you know, pretty much with a heavy heart. And once again, it wasn't until Friday that something clicked and I, I knew where I needed to go with the sermon. On Friday, I realized that the scripture that we read, that um, Paul read today, is all about power and the power that people use to hurt others, to manipulate others, to take their children away, to, um, to get what they want in the world, which, you know, I'm not really sure what the government wanted. We're told it was, we wanted them to assimilate to our culture, um, but there seems to be a lot of stuff pointing to genocide. So this power that people use and those around those situations that see things happening, you know, the te not all teachers in those schools must have been bad people. They must have known though that things were going on and how they acquiesced or gave in to that power and turned away and let it continue. So when I started to think of that, it made it almost worse, that throughout history, there have been crimes that have hurt men, women, and children. They've lost their lives and their spirits and their culture because of the misuse of power. And why is that? As I read through some material this week, I found a poem um, in the resource Spill the Beans that I use um, frequently. The poem's called the dynamic of power. So I'm going to read you the poem. This is what it says. Power may enable lending strength, drawing out wisdom, enhancing all that is already present, weaving together gifts and desires, facilitating harmony, creator and creation working together as one. Power may corrupt, taking us from that which we are called, bringing out the worst instead of the best, scorching all in its path, trampling, devouring, leaving no room for another vision, another singular vision or purpose. We choose the dynamic by the way we hold power, holding on tightly or openly sharing, and by the way we respond to the power of others, being caught up in the drama or quietly subverting, choosing to enable or corrupt the dynamic of power. Our scripture is all about power, the expectations and the assumptions of how it will be used. The, we meet the Israelite community and they are at the end of 125 years of being overseen by judges. Judges were chosen by God and they lived within a community, a tribe. They were one of the 12 tribes of Israel and one from all tribes of Israel at one time or the other. And their role was to settle disagreements between the members of the Israelite community and with their neighbors surrounding countries. The judges were a successive line of individuals, each from the, a tribe of Israel, chosen by God to rescue the people at a particular time in their history and to establish justice. The individuals chosen by God for the gifts that they had, for their God-given gifts, that the Creator knew would allow them to be a good judge for the people. 
Now Samuel had been a judge of Israel, and we meet him today in the closing almost moments of his, um, I'm going to say, rule. Samuel had replaced Eli as judge. You might remember the story of Samuel being called by God when he was a young boy, about 12, when he was working with Eli at the temple. And at the time, God gave Samuel a message to say that you know, Eli would no longer be judge and that Eli's sons wouldn't be judges either because they had become corrupt. They would take bribes and you know, use the women that were at the temple for their own pleasure. And so Samuel does become judge. But more than a judge, he was seen as a prophet by the people. He could see into the future and was able to tell the community what was best for them, um, considering what lied ahead. Unfortunately, though, Samuel was a a, the judge in Israel in a time of a lot of conflict. In particular, the Philistines um, dominated the region, including is the property where Israel was. Samuel had a lot to look after, and oddly enough, he too had made his sons judges, I um, don't know, maybe to help with the workload or whatever, but he had named his two sons to be judges in the community. And just like Eli's sons, Samuel's sons were corrupt. They had been taking bribes and payments to settle matters that came before them in their courts. As a result of the corruption and the fact that the judge system didn't seem to be elevating the, the Jewish community in, on the world stage at the time, the elders of the community went to Samuel and said that they wanted a king. They wanted a king who would, um, you know, when other countries looked at them, they would see the power that a king, you know, offered their nation. They would, they would have somebody who would make their decisions for them on a grand scale about the direction of, of their country and where they were, would be headed. That would make their life easier because they, you know, someone's off making the decisions and they could just simply live their lives. Now Samuel was hurt by this request. Um, let's face it, you're, you're doing a job and you think you're doing okay and then people come and say, yeah, we want somebody else. Um, and we want you to arrange for that to happen. Samuel was sure that the people wanted to change because they didn't appreciate him as a judge. However, when he went to speak um, with God, God said, you know, no, their desire for change has a whole lot more to do with my relationship with them. They are tired of me being their king. They want a king like the other nations have in the other kingdoms around the world and I'm not that kind of king. So Samuel was charged by God to point out the challenges that an earthly king would bring about. Unlike God, a king would be driven by self-interest, tempted by the gifts and rights bestowed upon them. They would make decisions that, not, that were not necessarily good for the whole community. They would need money, so they would collect taxes. They would want a showy military force, and so they would force people to join the military. And they would spend a lot of money to impress the nations around them. Now, despite the fact that these were very large differences between God as their king and living in God's kingdom, versus a, a human king and living in a kingdom that represented or was 
um, similar to the kingdoms around them. But one of the d biggest differences between the two is that a king would not rebuke their people. A king would be tempted to, you know, kind of let their people get away with some things um, that would make sure that, that he or she as queen was liked, that the people didn't want to, you know, overthrow them or, or you know, be, become traitors to them. They would possibly, and more than likely, bend the rules for some, and their, their subjects would be victim to the whims of, of, of the ruler as they tried to figure out how best to stay in power. But a king is what the people wanted, and a king is what the people got. Now, we don't have a king or a queen that runs our nation. Um, maybe at one time we did. However, we have chosen people who, who are given the power to lead our country, given the power to make our decisions for us that affect us in our homes and in our cities, as well as, you know, on the international stage. Their decisions affect the way we um, live in creation. They affect the way we live in relation with others, and they affect ultimately our relationship with God. We entrust our leaders to have our best interests in heart and to do what's best for the whole. And yet when our government and the powers that be make decisions in order to impress other nations or as a desire to please the majority in Canada, there are always those that seem to be left out of the budget, the policies, and the benefits. In Canada for a really long time, the ones that have been left out of important decisions that took care of the majority have been our Indigenous communities. For long years, the majority of us have closed our eyes, our hearts, and our minds to the injustices that take place right here in our own, our own home. We have been able, because we have leaders that make the decisions for us, to point our fingers and, and put the blame on them while we sit back and enjoy our comfortable life that they have ensured that we have. We haven't stepped in to stop the injustice. We have not taken the time to uncover what has been hidden despite knowing for a very long time that the residential schools have been horrible places of rights, violations, and crimes. If we continue to do this, we will build a kingdom just like all the others. But this will not be a world that in any way represents God's dream of a kingdom where peace and love reigns. We need to open our hearts. We need to open our ears to hear God weeping with the children, to understand that our call is to stand up and protect our young ones, to protect the vulnerable in our, our societies to protect the ones who are left behind when policies are made that provide comfort for us. We need to look around and see what's being missed. We are the majority. And if we the majority are who the government aims to please so they can stay in power, we, start, we need to start saying that what will please us is justice for our indigenous communities, is justice for those who live on the margin, is justice for every Canadian. Once we, the majority, call upon our government 
and say, we're not happy with you. This needs to change. They, things will change. If we want to reconcile with our brothers and sisters from indigenous communities, we need to learn what it is that they want. And then we need to stand with them when they ask for it. We choose the dynamic of power by the way we respond to the power of others. Will we get caught up in drama or quietly subvert? Will we choose to enable or corrupt the power God has given us to change the world? May it be so. Amen. The work of the church isn't always obvious, but as members of St. Mark's United Church, we have done work and are doing work to make a difference in this world. We ask that you consider how you might want to um, contribute your gifts to this work. Time, talent, and money all make a difference. So as we enter into this time where we consider offering our gifts to God for the love that we have received, may you consider how to offer that love to others and God in return. Offering at this time can be received through PAR payments that are arranged through the church office, through e-transfers that can be made to the church office as well as um, putting a check through the, the door slot at the church or in the mail. Thank you for the gifts that you have sent and will continue to offer the church in the future. Jesus Christ, you are the servant king. You gave all that we might know the love of God and the gift of relationship. We come humbly before you today and offer you our very selves, all that we have and all that we are. Receive our gifts of money, take and use them for the work of your kingdom here and now. Amen. God of all, you are the master and commander of all life. We thank you for the wonder of the universe, for the beauty and fragility of it all. You reign over it and ask us to be stewards looking after all creation. We are grateful for the people 
who lead us in science and technology, who discover amazing facts about the universe, the ways to help us learn to look after it more wisely. We give thanks for the people who lead us in medical research, who pioneer new treatments and procedures that give people a better quality of life. We thank you for the people who wrote stories and create characters and places that help us explore our nature and place in the universe and beyond into the unknown. We are grateful for the people who seek to become peacemakers, who create safe places for people to enter into dialogue, sacrificing much to help all humanity. We give thanks for the people who choose to serve their country and try to make the world a better place for everyone. We thank you for the people who take on leadership roles and seek to serve in whatever way you have called them. Lord, our world needs more people to seek you out and follow where you lead. Lord, our world suffers when people choose a different way, a way that does not benefit all life. Lord, give us courage to lead the way and the strength to stand up to fear and doubt. So be it. Amen. Hi there. It's Linda Wilkie here to talk to you from your friendly Affirm Committee. And I'm here to talk to you about why Pride Month is important to me. So first of all, happy Pride Month, everybody. It's June. This year, Pride will again be different, and I imagine that there are no large events or parades we can get to for safety's sake, and that's as it should be. Maybe we should each parade around our homes in wild outfits and sing Parachute Club's Rise Up song or any of the other anthems that have been celebrated over the years. I hope that you all spend some time this month thinking about the LGBTQIA Two Spirit Plus folks in your lives. If you are comfortable, wish them a happy Pride. Ask them how they are doing with no Pride events or parties or softball games. It's always nice to be acknowledged. Some folks feel invisible in their gender and or their sexuality. The point of this month, I think, is to celebrate and embrace all the different genders, sexualities, and identities, or lack thereof. There are more and more labels. For some, these labels and distinctions are very important. Even if you don't think they are, or they're not important to you, they are to lots of people. Out of respect, please acknowledge those differences, be it pronouns, heterosexual assumptions, or using an old name. I can now say that I have called myself a lesbian for 40 years this month. That means I came out at 26. For me, coming out meant that I admitted to myself that I was a lesbian. I certainly demonstrated traditional gay behavior and feelings as a child and young adult, but didn't have the language or the guts uh, to say so out loud. I would have appreciated coming out sooner as I was a pretty unhappy teen and young woman. Because of things like Pride Month and Canadian acceptance of alternate lifestyles, lots of folks are coming out at younger ages. Imagine getting support for being different like that in high school through those gay straight alliances. What if that kind of support had been in place 50 years ago? My goodness. I am grateful that I did come out when I did, earlier than some and later than many. And it was pretty easy for me because I came out immediately after kissing a girl for the very first time. Those feelings had been there a long time, but now they had a name, lesbian. Although I was a practicing homosexual at the time, early 80s, I can now say I've reached the professional standing. I have a membership card and everything. Kidding aside, I consider Pride Month important in that it gives space to folks who don't always get space. If it truly is all about love, why are we so reactive to differences or new things? The message is love every time, all the time. Jesus said so. Thanks. Bye.
Lord of all, you who turned power on its head, who showed us about true power, that it was found in vulnerability, guide us and guard us. May we find our security in you. May we trust and not be afraid. And even when we are, may we know your presence with us always. Bless us on our way this day and every day. Amen.